Hey, I got to catch up with our friends at Shimano at Sea Otter, and one of the things they wanted to point out to me was one of the hardest things to see in all of cycling equipment, and that is the bottom of your shoes. It's true. When I'm riding, I rarely look at the bottom of my shoes. And if I do, something has happened. <laughs> it's, once your shoes are on, you're hoping to not really see the soles until after the ride is done. But believe me, mountain bike shoe treads are important. For 99% of the pedal systems out there, including Shimano pedals, the tread is what is most often touching the pedal. So while your uppers may look good, if your tread has been worn down, shoe to pedal contact, less than optimal. Then there's the walking. Chances are you will experience some walking at Leadville, top of Columbine, bottom of a power line, headed home, two prime spots where many Leadville racers are on foot, which gets me back to Sea Otter and Shimano. Shimano's XC mountain bike shoes have a new sole design called UL Tread or Old Tread. If you like, Old Tread is a new rubber compound that improves grip when clipped in and while on foot. Yeah, and it comes in three models, the XC902, the XC702, and XC502. The main difference between these three models is stiffness, with the 902, of course, being the stiffest and the 502 being the most compliant, I guess, the softest. <laughs> and all three of them have the BOA system. And like we said, all three use Shimano's new Ultred tread design. Shoes are a tough category, folks. It's hard to be everything for every foot, but Shimano has a broad lineup and there's a good chance there's something that will fit and will keep your feet happy, whether you are pedaling or walking. Yeah, so go take a look at your soles. Check the tread for wear. And if it's not making good contact with your pedals and your cleats are touching the ground when you walk, it's time to make a change. If your soles have seen better days, check out Shimano shoes with Ultrad. And thanks as always to Shimano. That's bike.shimano.com for being the title sponsor of this show. Three. Leadville, the podcast for the 100-mile mountain bike race presented by Shimano. It is season five, episode four of the show that breaks down, builds up, gets you ready, and freaks you out for the highest and hardest one-day mountain bike race in the country. I'm Michael Houghton, hide it a most. And I am Fatty. In this episode, we get off the bike and head to the gym. Kathy Waite of the coaching team Weight Endurance will be here to talk about how to build a stronger Leadville race. Oh, yeah. Good old strength training, a favorite soapbox of mine. Have I told you, <laughs> Fatty, that I like getting in the gym? What? That I think it is key to being a well-prepared Leadville racer? <laughs> you have, Hottie. You have often and at length. And this season, I am actually taking your advice. I'm responding to your preaching. So we're going to be hearing from my strength coach on just how much off-bike training we need to be doing. Before that, though, Hottie, I want to tell you a little bit about a ride I did last weekend. All right. What ride was that? I raced the Leadville 100. Hmm. Sort of. <laughs> so last weekend, Lisa and I had a four-hour training ride scheduled, but bad weather for both Saturday and Sunday were on the, were on the weather radar. So We'd been thinking about doing something that you mentioned a couple seasons ago in this very show. The fact that you can ride a virtual Leadville 100 and you can do it using Ruby, among other things. Now, I it thought, you know, well, nothing could motivate me for racing Leadville like getting on my bike in the basement and racing Leadville. So we decided to give this virtual Leadville a shot. Yeah, that was something we talked about in season three. In fact, we had DC Rainmaker on that show to come on and talk about, you know, the number of platforms that are out there that kind of help you simulate a course or an activity. Um, you can obviously do this through more than just Ruby. I mean, Garmin, you can follow an activity on, on Garmin. It will kind of dish out the pan as you ride along the course. You don't get any visuals that way other than the map. Wahoo has a follow course or follow activity uh, feature to it. Like you said, Ruby Tax has one. Tax has a great one where you follow a map. It works quite well. 
and uh, Be Cool, another you know training app interactive platform, has a follow a map function too, so you could follow along if there is a map on its platform uh, of the Leadville course. And I also want to know too if you if you just want to ride and get a feel for the Leadville situation. Obviously, there's the movies. You can put the movie up and do a four hour training session like you did. You and uh, Lisa did there, Fatty. Um, but I found this great uh, video of somebody racing the Leadville 100 at trailgenius.com. It's under their events section. There's a map and a video of the race. Now, again, it's not going to control your smart trainer, but the video is well shot and offers some terrific views of the Leadville course. And, you know, obviously you'll get hours and hours of of riding out of it, of entertainment while you're on your trainer. Yeah, and entertainment was kind of one of the things that we were after, too. And so here was the setup that we went with last week when, when we tried it. So we were using Apple TV, um, which is our tool of choice for using uh, doing Zwift and so forth. We have two Apple TVs set up on two monitors with two Tax Neo 2Ts. So Lisa and I are able to train together at the same time, you know, watching our individual monitors. And... We were kind of expecting a Zwift-like experience, um, and that's maybe too high of a bar <laughs> because that is not what we got. The The Ruby Apple TV ex- interface is bad. I'm not going to candy coat this. It was just really bad. I mean, it took, I think, 15 minutes or so for us to pair and then get things set up and just using the interface was kind of a disaster. But once we got past that, uh, you know, maybe it was my own mistake for thinking that I was going to get something kind of Zwifty, but I thought I'd be seeing a video of the Leadville course and at least on the Apple TV interface for Ruby, it was just, you know, a dot on a topo map. Yeah, Ruby does offer videos uh, that, that are shot by usually other writers and they will go ahead and, you know, kind of sync those videos up with the erg mode in your trainer. And I did, I think, back a couple years ago, find a video that someone had put up from the Leadville race day. It wasn't very good. It didn't have all the features. Like, Ruby has, like, avatars, hmm. and you can race along some uh, aside an avatar on it. Uh, again, this is two years ago. I, I don't know what's up there now. You probably know better than I. But, right, exa- you know, you're exactly right. It's not exactly a visual feast. Yeah, I- at least on the Apple TV, and you know, I, I haven't tried doing it on an iOS device or on any other kind of phone or on a computer of any sort. I just did it on the Apple TV. So, you know, this is not a review. This is just my experience. I, you know, I thought it was going to look better than it did. I thought it was going to be easier to use than it was. But once we got it working, it was actually a really good and fun workout. Now, I, I know you tried part of doing, you know, did a few miles of Leadville on the Ruby. Lisa and I did the first 60 miles of it. That is all the way to the top of Columbine and then back down to Twin Lakes Dam. <laughs> so, I mean, it was it was rough and it was actually a lot of fun just sort of watching your dot on the map. If you know Leadville already, it is kind of fun seeing it's like, oh, you know, I actually didn't realize, you know, how closely you you trace along Turquoise Lake. Oh, you oh, now I see how Hagerman's fits into this whole picture. Seeing the map is something that is kind of fun to do. You know, so if you like maps, you're going to have a little bit of fun. Um, you know, meanwhile, Lisa and I are always playing this game uh, when we when we train together. Uh, we take turns shouting out to our ver- to our smart speaker the next song to play. Uh, she tends to uh, favor Disturbed and Foreigner, and I'm sort of a human catalog of hits from the 80s. Uh, it, 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 I mean, so 60 miles, 40 uh, or four hours, it was tough. It was very tough and fun. Lisa likes hot-blooded. Uh, you were mm, all over the place, huh? <laughs> a little Human League or something, or is that where you are? Human League, yes. I I would say uh, anything that is from from the eighties, especially you know, basically eighty four to eighty seven. That's me. That is me. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, how did this ride go in the end? I I will say it is worth doing. Right. It answers the question. You know, what if the Leadville one hundred were on pavement? <laughs> 
<laughs> so because you're not experiencing any of the mountain bike aspect of it. And what if the Leadville 100 were at your home altitude? <laughs> and, and what if you could, instead of, you know, hanging on for dear life down the power line, what if you could sit up and sort of soft pedal and get up to freeway speeds on, <laughs> on going down the power line, right? Even with all of those questions, you know, making for an easier Leadville experience than you would have doing it in Leadville, it is still a very hard workout. And that's even just the first 60 miles. So I would recommend it. It's obviously not a perfect gauge of how you're doing physically, how your fitness is, but it is a good gauge. And if you find yourself, you know, unable to get to the summit of this virtual Columbine, you've probably got some work to do between now and August 13th to get to the real summit of the real Columbine. So, you know, it's worth taking this two-week free trial you can get with Ruby. And, you know, if you've got a smart trainer and a big training day coming up and it's coinciding with bad weather, why not give it a try? So, and and this is uh, my my last point here, Hottie, but it, this was kind of fun. As a bonus to the casual observer on Strava, it actually looked like Lisa and I had ridden the first 60 miles of the Leadville 100. So... And I, I was seriously cooked by the end of this ride. And I got to say, I'm, I'm very curious, you know, how the power line climb would feel on a trainer. So, you know, maybe next time. There you go. Cue it up for power line homebound. You Ooh. and Ruby throwing it down there. Good idea. <laughs> Yeah. All right, you know, Fatty, with all the changes that can happen year to year, it is nice when something stays the same. A little consistency can go a long way. And that's why we're happy to announce that we, again, are racing in DNA kits. It's the fit we know, the chamois we're comfortable with, not getting used to something new when we're trying to get ready for that A++ race is important. It's A++ if not A++++, right? And the nice thing about this kit is the design is fresh and new, but the kit is what you expect and it fits so great. You know, underneath the updated logo and the colors are the fabric and the stitching that I've honestly trusted for all of my writing, all of it for several years. DNA is all about custom, but if you put the, you know, these great looking designs on terrible clothing, nobody would buy it. Whether or not you are wearing our colors, ones of your own, we'd encourage you to go to the DNA store, get a jersey and a pair of bibs and see if you have the same reaction as Fatty and me. Great fit, all day comfort, arrow if you want that. By the way, the BioFit jersey is one of our hot tips. It is designed with arrow in mind and in a long haul, sometimes high-speed bike race like Leadville, arrow is a thing. Yeah, at some point, the wind is going to be at your face in this race. And having your jersey flapping around is going to cost you seconds and watts and calories that you don't want to spend. So something we learned from our friend Josh Portner over at Silka in our sister podcast, Marginal Gains, you know, he consults uh, pro tour teams all the time on how to go fast. And he says the number one thing you can do, the cheapest way you can get faster is to wear a top that doesn't flap in the wind. So check out the full DNA lineup and get in on the custom custom thing over at dnacycling.com. Every part of this course kicks you in the teeth. <laughs> All right, as promised, this is the course. We are talking you through what you need to do to have the best possible day this August 13th from the days before the race to the shotgun blast at 6th and Harrison to every mile of pavement, goat trail, and single track to when you finally ride up the red carpet and get that finisher's medal hung around your neck. Ah, oh, it's exciting to think about that finisher's medal. Today, we are talking about the opposite end of the course, <laughs> the first couple miles of the race, including the starting line. And here is the first course tip of the day. Plan to get to the starting line as early as possible. I get there at about 5.30, a full hour before the race starts. Why an hour? For a couple of reasons. First, this is if, especially if this is your first time racing the Leadville 100, trust me, you do not yet grasp how big of a crowd there is going to be at the starting line on race day. Getting to the general area, much less the actual starting line, it takes time, effort, and some luck with the parking gods. Second, 
the sooner you get there, the better spot in the corral you're going to be able to get. That spot in the corral used to be a much more important reason than it is now because with a couple of minutes between each corral being released, it means the starting line congestion the LT100 is famous for is now a thing of the past. If you want to be near the front of your corral, great. Most people, though, will actually do better tucked in and riding with the flow of their corral. So it's more important that you get into the correct corral than where in the corral you get in. Yeah, it, it used to be you would see people really, you know, fighting like you were trying to get to be in the front row of a rock concert. It just doesn't matter anymore. It, in my experience last year, Hadi, was starting, you know, basically right in the dead center of the Green Corral. And it worked great. I think there is one exception to that rule, however, and it is going to apply to a lot of people. If you are in the backmost corral, that is the white corral, you are starting at the same time as I'm going to approximate here about a third of the racers, right? The folks in that group are going to run the gamut of experience. Honestly, if you can put yourself more toward the front of that pack, that's fewer mistakes that others can make that might ruin your day. Yeah, the reality is somebody has to be in the back third of the white corral, but that somebody does not have to be you. If you're going to be starting from the white, get to that starting line early. Yeah. So what do you do while you were standing in that corral for an hour? That's a slow moving hour. I will tell you that. For one thing, you're going to shiver is what you're going to do because you are going to be cold. But if you brought a jacket and track pants that you're willing to give up, maybe, you know, something you bought at a thrift store a couple of weeks before the race, you can wear those right up until the last five or 10 minutes before 6.30 a.m. Maybe you've written your name and number on a tag on the inside, then toss them to your crew or a helpful stranger on the side. And there is a pretty good chance, I would say a two in three chance, that you will get them back after the race. Now, the next thing you can and should do while you're waiting is go to the bathroom one more time. You want to do this. And there's um, generally plenty of outhouses and so forth on, on or near the start line. So you'll find them. There could be lines, but use them for sure. To that end, make a friend with a person standing next to you in the corral and then make a bargain with that person. You'll hold their bike while they go to the porto and they hold yours while you're gone. Congrats. You've just made your first race ally of the day. <laughs> and it's good to have an ally. And the final thing to do while you are waiting in the, your corral is eat. The first, hour, the first hour or so of the race is crowded. It is intense. And you are less likely than the whole rest of the day to find an opportunity to fuel during that first hour. So when it's 610 or so in the morning, load up. I personally am a big fan of Bonk Breaker energy bars um, before the race, which, by the way, you can order at thefeed.com. But frankly, eat whatever kind of bar or fuel is your favorite and has worked for you before your big training rides throughout the season. So, yes, this is a reminder to train like you race throughout the year. Practice eating that same thing right before all of your big training rides. Likewise, if you're going to use an on-again, off-again approach to hydration packs, consider one of the first part of the race for the same reason you want to eat something before the race begins. You know, if you think about it, for the first hour to two hours of the Leadville 100, you are in some tight knots of people. And then you have a big hard climb, then rolling double track with one good line and a lot of people passing. And then a bomber white knuckle paved ascent. A hydration pack from the start line to pipeline can be a real friend. Yeah, that is a really good tip right there, Huddy. I've gone both ways off the starting line. And I actually think this year I may use a USWE pack from the starting line this year for exactly the reason that you're describing. In the final minutes before the race gun, do a little final systems check while you're there as well. Is your GPS on and ready to start? Is your helmet buckled? That's a good one to have done. <laughs> Is your bike in the gear you want to start the race? And that's a very good tip. How do you want to get away? You want to start spinning like Mighty Mouse or do you want to start cranking and get some forward momentum? Yeah, it could go the other way as well. I, I have ridden downhill to the starting line and you get in a big gear. You don't check that. And then you stand up at the beginning of the race and you find that you are in your tallest gear. No bueno. 
honestly, every year I hear someone doing a big gnashy gear shift right at the starting line. And <laughs> you know that sound. And it would really suck to drop a chain in the first 10 feet of the Leadville 100. So the anthem plays, you put your helmet back on, the gun goes off. And as soon as that happens, your corral starts walking forward. And then at whatever intervals the race decides, last year the interval length went up as the corrals got bigger. But, you know, we've heard rumblings of shorter time gaps between corrals this year. Sooner than you would think, it's going to be your corral and your turn to go. And a lot of our previous warnings from uh, version 1.0 of the course still uh, will fall to the wayside here because of the wave starts. A lot of the traditional cautions no longer apply. We used to warn, you know, of the accordion effect 200 yards into the race. This is no longer a big deal unless you're at the back of the White Corral, which is big enough that we should mention a couple hundred yards into the race, you stop descending and then you turn uphill. You're going to see and hear breaking well before you get to that little uphill kicker. Yeah, but for most of you, that accordion effect no longer applies. I've seen people lock up, however, <laughs> and very narrowly avoid going down on it would be in that, at the bottom of that little dip. And it's sad because it's super unnecessary. It is very easy to fixate on a wheel a foot ahead of you instead of keeping your eyes up and on what's ahead. And, you know, if you see something like that, make sure you call it out as you break so you don't wind up having the person behind you also get surprised and rear-ending you. And we used to warn about that right turn on McCarthy Drive right after the middle school. It's still worth noting that the inside line is tempting there, but often has some gravel on top of the pavement. That's loose over hard, folks. That's not a good recipe for traction. But the pinch of that turn is no longer too big of a problem. Still, just call it out. Yeah, and one more. We used to warn about the right turn about 1.8 miles from the beginning of the race from Turquoise Lake Road onto yet another road also called Turquoise Lake Road. But that turn is no longer a problem. There is so much more open space, plenty of room to turn. You've got room to pass. You've got room to let people get by. Of course, it is still important to be safe. But the paved downhill section, you know, the three point something miles of it at the beginning of the race is not the freak out concern that it used to be. Hmm. I used to love that freak out. I'm a I'm a old crick guy, so it never bothered me, but I get it. I mean, I understand <laughs> why Lifetime did what they did. Um, by the way, folks, this was not easy for them. I mean, they obviously heard from traditionalists like me, like Ken Clover, who wanted to keep the whole pack going off. And it's, it's more stressful, too, for the local authorities in town, for the Leadville police and the sheriff's department there, to get the, the waves going and to get the corrals out in their individual waves. So hats off to them for getting this done. Um, there is still a lot of energy here, a lot of adrenaline as you're rolling out of town. So remember to be safe. Move up only when you can. Communicate your moves, you know, on your left, on your right, and steer clear of sketchy yeah. riders. Then three and a half miles into the race, you are making one last turn off the pavement and onto the Jeep road. And now you are on a couple miles of flat dirt before St. Kevin's. And the first big uh, climb of the day. And that's where we'll pick you up uh, next time on the dirt, on the course. Yeah. Hey, last show we told you about Envy's five-year manufacturer's warranty. It covers defects in the product. Well, Envy has yet another safety net that is pretty amazing. It is something they call lifetime incident protection. Yeah, it is coverage that is, frankly, almost too good to be true, but it is true. And here's how it is spelled out by Envy. Envy says, Envy Carbon is engineered for performance and designed to lead the market in strength, durability, and ride quality. We do not design products to be indestructible. <laughs> what? <laughs> so if you exceed the limits of your product while riding, crashing, or driving your roof-mounted bike into the garage, don't worry, we've got your back. Oh, man. Have you ever done that, Hottie? What? <laughs> no, I've never done that, but that's unbelievable. So yeah. I drive my bike into a into a garage door and mess up my MV wheels, and it sounds like, I mean, that's amazing, right? Yeah. I've got my back. 
you know? I might mean, have to replace the bike, but hey, I get my wheels and my fork if I got one of those or some bars. I mean, I've heard of crash replacement where a company gives you a discount to replace your damaged stuff, but this is incredible. The incident protection terms and conditions say Envy will replace wheels or bars or posts, damaged or destroyed in a crash or an oops, like having your bike on a roof rack and driving into a garage, as we just mentioned. The Envy stuff will be replaced as long as it is the property of the original owner. The only cost is shipping. You know, a buddy of mine once had his exhaust pipes melt some carbon rims. That would be covered under Envy's incident protection program. Oh, I remember that. That was right before the crusher and the tusher. That was <laughs> that was freaky. That was heartbreaking. Very, very <laughs> scary. I I don't think I've ever told you, Hadi. I actually one time did drive my roof rack with four bikes on it into my garage door. That was a very expensive expensive moment. No envy there. Unfortunately, it was back before envy even existed. But man, that would have been nice to know. That would have been really, really nice to have. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think they would have covered the cost of the damage I had to my car, which was not minor, and to my garage. Not an envy car, no. And, <laughs> if it's an envy car, if they make cars, maybe. Oh, I would buy an envy car. Absolutely. So here's what is not covered. Normal wear and tear or improper setup, obviously not covered. Otherwise, as the program says, Envy has got your back. Like we've said before, Envy is a premium product company with a price to match. But on the back end, you get such a killer warranty. An amazing crash replacement, plus all the performance you need for a very good day at the Leadville 100. Check out all of Envy's products and its class-leading lifetime incident protection program at Envy. That's E-N-V-E dot com. Hi, I'm Cody Waite with Weight Endurance. We're going to be demonstrating the aerobic strength intervals. Three, two, one, start. Crank it really hard for the first five, 10 seconds. Our coaching team is back, and this time we are getting with the other half of weight endurance to talk strength training. Patty, a couple of research documents I came across regarding gym work and cycling. Here's what they said. One reviewed 12,000 records on strength training and aerobic exercise. It appeared in the Journal of Sports Medicine, and it found that over a four-week period, people who lifted twice a week and did cardio not only got stronger, but they shed 1.4% body fat. That's in a four-week period. Not bad. And a German study that followed 30 competitive cyclists who participated in a year-long gym workout program not only increased their strength, but also their endurance. Look, it's pretty easy to find a study to support any thought or any theory, but the evidence is becoming clear that being a stronger person is great for endurance performance, especially these long, grueling events. Yeah, and for the first time in all of my Leadvilles, I'm incorporating some off-the-bike movement to get myself ready. You know, Dave Weens used to say a little weightlifting gave him kind of a protective shield against the rigors of mountain biking. I love that thought. For more thoughts and some advice on the topic, we turn to Kathy Waite of Weight Endurance. She is a certified USA weightlifting coach, a USA tri coach. She was an Exeter national champion. She has done the Leadville stage race and the Silver Rush. So, let go of the handlebars for a little bit, grab a pair of dumbbells, and we're going to do a little bit of Leadville strength training. All right, Kathy Wait, I am so glad you're here because I, I am probably one of the few athletes that says they love, love, but I like to lift weights. Like, it actually makes me feel good. I went yesterday, did a leg workout, and I have long been a proponent to our listeners here, to my co-host, Fatty, that folks should go out as part of their training for Leadville and pick up heavy things, right? Get some strength going, right? Because these are the, this is the type of movement and the type of training that really can not only save your race, but just make you a better human being. So you can just echo what I said, said, Hottie, you're absolutely right. People should strength train, or you can go ahead and give us a more educated and scientific reason as to why strength training does make sense for an endurance athlete. Well, th- first of all, thank you for having me on the show. This is very fun. Um, I am also a lover of strength training, and I think it's great to move our bodies in different ways. When we're on the bike, 
we are moving in one direction. We're like repetitively moving the pedals in one way. And to go into a gym or your garage or the basement and move your body in different planes and in different ways, I think just makes you feel good and creates a stronger human being. And in my opinion, a stronger and faster uh, cyclist on the mountain bike. And bottom line is, if you can't, uh, you can't race if you can't get to the start line. And I think you need to be a strong human being to endure the long hours and the high volume of Leadville training, um, because it's hard. And if you can't keep yourself safe from overuse injuries, imbalances that we all have, then you won't be able to race on race day. All right, fatty show over. That's it. That's all needs to be said. Go pick up something heavy. (laughs) In spite of the way Hottie is positioning me, I am actually the one who is watching the videos of Kathy and following along. I am a believer. This is new to me, however. So, Kathy, for the very many Leadville athletes who have never lifted or are late to lifting, people who are in their 40s, maybe in their 50s, and have a lot of fitness, you know, very strong legs, maybe even, you know, if, if they're single speeders, a good set of arms and a, a decent core to boot, <laughs> but have not done any specific strength or flexibility training. How do we get started? Mm, such a good question. It's never too late to start. Everything can be modifiable. Um, it's It's... Nothing is too small to start doing. Just doing a couple planks a day is better than doing nothing. It doesn't have to be this huge time commitment. You know, one of the most common complaints, and you guys know this, from cyclists out there, I don't have time to strength train. I already have a limited schedule. I, I have 10 hours. I want to be on my bike for those entire 10 hours. But if you could just do two 30-minute sessions a week, that's an hour every week. That's 52 hours by the end of the year of strength work you did not do previously. So it's like baby steps. Let's start moving our bodies in different ways. Let's start activating all of, the, all of those supporting muscles that we need to have firing. Cyclists are very quad dominant. You guys know this. And that creates an imbalance. Our hamstrings are weak. Our glutes are weak. Our low back starts hurting on the bike because it's weak. Our neck hurts. Oh my gosh, I do have... Um, sore neck issues sometimes. And so, you know, this is a long race you guys are getting ready to do. It's hours and hours on the bike. And if you want to be comfortable on the bike, you got to start strengthening everything and start addressing those imbalances. So it's not too late to start. Um, You know, a program like ours can help you walk through all the different parts of your body so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming. And you just start checking them off the list and you learn the movements and You'll get better at them as you do them, and you'll start feeling stronger and start feeling better, and you'll be more motivated to keep doing the training. Uh, Kathy, I'm one of the lucky ones out there in that, you know, I can go into the gym as much as I want, lift as much as I want, and my level of bulk is pretty minuscule. Like, I'm, what do they call them, ectomorph, or, you know, guys that just kind of stay skinny no matter what they do. However, there are other folks out there that put on mass pretty easily, and look, we just did a, a diet episode, or I think it was our last episode or something like that, where we talked about you know how weight conscious and weight phobic the endurance athlete, the left level athlete can be. So for those folks that say, Kathy, I really don't want the extra mass, like doing bicep curls <laughs> and bench presses and leg presses, I just don't want to carry all that extra muscle weight around with me over 105 miles. You say what to that? We are not trying to be bodybuilders or like pure weightlifters. We are trying to be functionally strong so we can endure a long event and um, move our bodies like one with a bike. Everyone wants to be one with your bike. You can't be one with your bike if you can't control all your limbs. And so actually our focus in our in our strength program program, especially this time of year, is not about super heavy weights at all. It's actually about functionally moving often single leg movements or single arm movements that you have to control your midline while moving weight with one limb. I think that translates well into controlling your bike. 
um, it also starts recruiting those stabilizing the supporting muscles around our joints that need to be strong. Heaven forbid we fall off our bike. We, we will actually have a better chance of not being injured if everything that surrounds your, your shoulder joint, your hip joint, your, your vertebrae, those muscles are strong. So yes, we do not we do not um, try to become big, bulky weightlifters. That's not the goal at all. And the type of movements we do in our program wouldn't cause that to happen anyway. Right. Now, as I mentioned at the top of this uh, interview, I've been watching your videos. I've been following along. And, you know, it, it's basically an hour long twice a week that that I'm putting into this. Of course, we can't go into an entire workout in this episode, but maybe you could give our listeners a sense of what they ought to be focusing on if they, you know, they don't have a program yet and are just wanting to get started themselves. So I like to first by uh, clarify by saying that I don't think of the core as just like my stomach muscles. The core to me is everything I would have left if my arms and legs were cut off. You know, heaven forbid that one too. So mm -hmm. when I say we need to start with our core, it's shoulder joints, um, the front of our abdominal area, the sides, the, the the low back, and our hip joints. So our sessions after, starts with like 10, 15 minutes of core movements after some dynamic warm up movements, and each of those core movements are designed to kind of target body parts, the body parts of the core that I just mentioned, the shoulders, the hips, the, the abdominals, the low back. Um, and then from there, I feel like my body is ready and primed to do like some bigger movements. And that's when we would move into some squat movements, some hip hinge or deadlift movements, some jumping, and some pushing and pulling. But the little muscles, in my opinion, need to be sort of awakened before we can tackle those big muscles. Yeah, so give us an idea of what kind of work we'd be looking at in the gym. Say we're on a two-day, a week program that weight endurance is prescribed for us. What kind of moves would we be doing, and are we doing a low rep, a high rep thing, heavy, lightweights? Kind of break that down for us. Right. If we had this conversation in December, it'd be a very different conversation because in the winter months, we are lifting heavy weights. That is important. Like you started the, the podcast saying, uh, Hadi, that go lift heavy weights. There is like great value in being able to do that safely. But this time of year, it's it is the time where people are putting more miles and more hours on the bike. And we have to switch to more of like a maintenance phase and um, again, like functional movement. So a typical session you might see in our program this time of year would be the dynamic warm up where you're moving different ways. You sort of follow along and like yoga s sort of things just to get everything going. And then core movements. I love, love, love any kind of plank. You can make them simple. You can make them fancy. You can target um, the front of your body with a plank, the sides, the back, really the beauty of planks is that it hits so many things. Um, so a lot of our videos and movements on our, our app that we use is our, our plank based because there's so many options and you can do them anywhere. You could be traveling for work and do this in your hotel room. We also love to incorporate that stability ball, that sort of blown up inflatable ball. You can just do so much with that complex movements. Um, you know, say laying on your shoulder blades on the ball and twisting from your arms to one side and then to the other while having to keep your butt from sagging down to the ground. So it's like really controlling your midline while moving body parts. And those are those are some of my favorite movements. So a lot of cross body movements where you're having to control um, your balance, maybe on one foot, um, crossing over the plane of your body to incorporate that midline stability. Um, I do like to do a lot of single leg uh, deadlifts at this time of year where you would hold a kettlebell or a, or a dumbbell. And you can hold it with two hands. That does help the stability, but you're standing on one leg and you're hinging from your hips, lowering the weight to the ground, standing back up. That requires so much balance, coordination, strength from your ankles all the way up to your neck. Everything has to work together to make a single leg deadlift work. And um, that's a great exercise right there. I like to mix that in with some single leg uh, squats or knee extensions, you could you could call them. And that would be something as simple as stepping up onto a box or a bench and back down again. 
one leg at a time, you're really having to stabilize yourself. I remember one of my lasting memories of uh, combining weight training with Leadville training is my triceps. I mean, by the time you hit sugar love descent on the way back, your arms could potentially be screaming out in pain. And in that season, I had done a a fair amount of upper body work, right? I went to a maintenance phase like you're talking about, about this time of year, but I kept the tricep, you know, activities up to, and I know that by the time I hit sugar loaf, mile 80 or whatever that thing is, I was able to survive that section and hold on to my bike because I'd done some good arm work. So upper body work, even though I think, you know, intuitively the athlete goes endurance athlete goes, what do I need upper body for? I'm a pusher. I push pedals all day. Why do I need strength up there? I would imagine you have that as part of your program as well. Pushing and pulling is a huge part of mountain biking. As I mentioned at the beginning, like mountain biking is a full body sport. You, you're not sitting on a stationary bike in the rec center. That's, that's not Leadville. You're, you're needing to recruit everything. So focusing on pushing movements and pulling movements are very important so that you can control your bike up and over rocks and around corners. So huge proponent of push-ups. Pulling motions, like, well, pull-ups are really hard for most people, but we modify with assisted pull-ups or ring rows or banded movements or bent-over rows. One of my favorite pulling motions is being in a bent-over over position with your feet slightly apart to mimic your pedal position. And then you're pulling the weights you know, upward. Your elbows are kind of going towards the ceiling. So you're pulling while in a bike-specific Um, set up. As you're going through a lot of these, the question that's on my mind is, of course, a selfish one. And that is, for someone who has started trying to do this a little bit later in life, I'm in my 50s. Some, you know, some of the motions that I see are really difficult to do. You know, the, the, you know, I, I feel a twinge in my ankles as I am trying to do these balance moves on one foot. For, for folks who are, you know, in their late 40s or in their early 50s or whatever age, what are the adaptations so that we can still get some benefit? We definitely all approach cycling and weightlifting with our own imbalances and weaknesses in our bodies. And some of the movements are going to be more difficult than others. In our program, I'm trying to give some options. It is difficult like doing sort of a one size fits all program. I do try to give like options for simplifying m- movements and making them more difficult. But nothing really does like replace one on one help. So if you are a, a raw beginner, you might want to invest in a few sessions with a personal trainer to help you you know identify what what you can and cannot do at that moment, especially if you're recovering from an injury, a surgery, a long break from the bike you know, hire a PT or a personal trainer just to help you get started. I'm a huge fan of going to see a physical therapist regularly anyway. You know, all the hours on the bike just take a toll on one's body. And maybe it's just my body, but I tend to have tweaks and problems. And I just think you need to kind of address those before they get out of control. But with all that said, if you are like brand new to strength training, it's not a bad idea to get some personal help. You know, jumping into a program, once you feel a little bit more comfortable moving your body can, um, you know, having some help beforehand can help get into a program. And then when you're doing a program like ours, you know, read the notes, watch the videos, um, and don't be afraid to reduce weights. You know, if I'm showing you a movement on one of my videos where I have a weight in my hand and you're brand new to it, don't do the weight, just do the body weight movement until you feel more comfortable. And, and just give yourself a break so that you can enjoy it, moving your body in a different way and get stronger as you're doing these movements. Another reason I love uh, weightlifting is it's a free dose of testosterone. You don't have to inject it, you just get it. Your body reacts that way to the weightlifting, to the cycles. Um, It's free drugs, fatty. Here you go, have a little testosterone. All you gotta do is go in there and start lifting stuff. And one of the ways to really encourage this that we've heard of, Kathy, is explosive moves like box jumps, you know? quick movements, whether it be weighted or unweighted, just plain old jumping. And this is both good for men and women, um, getting some type of hormonal release like that through these quicker moves. Is that something, do you use any type of quick maneuvers, whether it be in, you know, during the center of the training season like we are now or, or 
more in the winter? How, what's your feeling on those? Oh, I love plyometric movements. I love um, agility movements. I think it's really important to to move our bodies diagonally and differently. You know, if you don't use it, you will lose it. Um, so yes, jumping is really important. However, if, again, if you are very new to weight training, you can't just start like jumping up on a box, you will potentially hurt yourself. So make, you know, in my program, I try to build that in first, like, let's start with just some high knees. Let's start with some butt kicks, kicks. Let's start with some little agility hops on one foot. Let's start with some air squats. Let's start, then go on to jump squats. We're not going to progress right into high box jumps or kettlebell swings or weighted jumps until we know that our body can support a jumping motion. But bottom line, yes, jumping is really important for power production. And I do believe that translates to more powerful bike riding. And what's the timing on those? If you do get an athlete to that stage, do you do those in the run-up to a targeted event or do they have been, you know, months and months before? All the above. Like if they've been training with us over the winter, they would have been doing some sort of jumping motions, plyometrics then. If they're jumping in right now in our race prep program, we'll ease them into it with a little bit at a time until their bodies are ready for it. And the bottom line for me is always, you know, listen to your body. And I say right in the description, like, I will default to 10 reps. If you need to do three, you do three. If you need to do 15, you do 15. Now it's going to sound like I'm lazy, but I, I mean this question in, no, never. in the least lazy no. way possible. Well, I don't know. Maybe it is the most lazy way possible, but how little can I get away with? That's a great question. I think you could get away with doing two sessions of 30 minutes during this time of year. When we had extra time in the winter months, Cody and I were, were working out three times a week at the gym. Uh, now life feels a little bit crazier and busier and we're on the bike more and I'm squeezing in two 30 to 45 minute sessions each week. And as we, as we progress through, you know, and get closer to the, to the race and you, you are saying this as, someone who is not just a weight trainer, but also a racer yourself. Um, how little am, are we going to be doing, or, or is it more as we get closer to the race? I really don't know. The way my program is set up is that we'll have um, three weeks of two solid sessions per week. Then there'll be a lighter week on that fourth week. If someone is trying to mix in other fun races around town, then they can like grab those lighter week sessions during race week, that would be very appropriate. I do think it's important to back it off a little bit if you want to feel a little, you know, bouncier and peppier and stronger on race day. Now, as we move towards Leadville, those last two weeks before Leadville have very little. On the Monday, two weeks before, there's going to be like a 20 to 30 minute, more like a core session. And the same for the Monday of race week, it's mobility movements, and some core activation. Of course, this time of year too, Kathy, we're starting to pick up the training and the training on the bike at least is becoming more and more specific as we, you know, move along here. So the the balancing act becomes, yeah, I'm going to stay in the gym. I'm going to work out in the gym, but I want to make sure I'm recovered enough for those on the bike sessions and uh, muscle soreness. So how am I, what's enough time between like a gym session and, you know, a good a good bike session where I'm planning to do some efforts. And what can I do about good old DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness? Yeah, good question. I'm not a fan of being sore more than like a two or three out of 10 when you're trying to in incorporate strength training and serious cycling training. While we did lift heavier over the winter, I still... Heavy was, you know, relative. It's, you know, heavy is in air quotes. It's personal as well. What I think is a heavy is definitely not what my daughter Sophia thinks is heavy. I, I think my heaviest deadlift weight is her warm up weight. So we we all have to figure out like what works for us. But this time of year, now that we're outside riding a lot more as well, um, I do not want any of my athletes or myself to be more than like a two or three out of ten sore. And so we're we're constantly encouraging people to to start conservatively as they enter a strength training program to listen to their body. Um, and this, the app we use does track the weights that we've been lifting so that it does give you more of a guideline. So is the day after um, a weight session this time of year, 
or any gym session? Is it a recovery day on the bike or is it okay to do efforts on the bike? What is, how does that normally play out? On Mondays, we prescribe a strength program, a strength session. And then on Tuesday is a, usually an interval day that Cody's programmed. And that is why you can't do too much in the gym. You, you just want to find that sweet spot. It's the same way we have the philosophy for philosophy for bike training. We're never going all out unless we're in a race. So Cody's interval sessions on the bike are very specific, uh, you know, a percentage of your FTP, uh, capping out at a certain heart rate sometimes so that we're not maxing out the efforts. We also are not going to max out the efforts of the gym and then be unable to complete the, the interval session the next day. So, you know, it's all in, it's all like a juggling act, but I don't think it's going to be helpful to go so crazy in the gym that you can't do the workout on Tuesday. So a nice, solid strength session on Monday, intervals on Tuesday, a long ride on Wednesday, Thursday, another interval session, Friday, another strength strength session, and then the weekend riding. And if you need to fit a day off in there, of course, we work that out as well. Oh, I've been there. (laughs) I was lifting so much when you're fatty uh, and riding a lot. You know, I was in the winter and I was doing heavy leg work and then on Saturdays and Sundays going out for a hundred mile rides and stuff like that, that I got up one morning and just couldn't do anything. I was dead. I mean, I was into that. (laughs) I wasn't quite overtrained, but I definitely had overreached, Kathy. It was, I definitely could tell I was overreached and actually had to go in and see a professional about how I'd screwed myself up. Thankfully, he put me on the right track and I gold buckled anyhow, so it was all good in the end. How about um, another thing that, boy, I hear a lot of differing opinions on this one, and that is stretching. So where do you sit on a stretching program? Is this a good thing, okay thing? Is it something you guys include? There is a difference between being mobile and being flexible. Uh, mobility is more about like, can your joints move in such a way to allow you to have full range of motion for other movements, cycling or weightlifting movements? So let's first talk about being mobile enough to do proper work. Um, Number one, if you have a real situation, you should go see a physical therapist because they are the ones who are trained to help you in that arena. But our um, our core movements are intended to sort of awaken the muscles around your your supporting joints, and that can help get your body ready to be mobile in the full range of movement. That's not the same as flexibility. That I think is a little overrated. We don't want to just like overstretch our muscles and then try to do work. That's that's not ideal. We want to think about getting blood flow through our muscles, waking them up, activating them to do good work. So our, our strength session starts with what I would call dynamic warm-up movements to get the blood flowing and get moving. We do prescribe foam rolling and stretching after a session. And I would say the same thing for after a bike ride. You do some dynamic warm-ups before you get on the bike, you do stretching afterwards. And it is important, you know, if you tend to be someone who has a tight back, maybe you sit at a desk all day for work, then there are Definitely some things you should be doing off the bike, like foam rolling and opening up, foam rolling your upper back and opening up your thoracic spine, Um, working on, you know, stretching your neck, working on opening your pecs up so that you're not always hunched over because that will definitely translate to being uncomfortable on your bike. Um, So yes, you want to be properly mobile and you want to be flexible enough that you don't have injuries, but we're definitely not trying to do the splits or, um, you know, back walkovers. This is not a gymnastics program whatsoever. The way I, the way I ride it can be. I, I've done all kinds of gymnastics moves yeah. coming downhill <laughs> and flying off the bike. So I, <laughs> I might consider a little of that. So Kathy, obviously Leadville is a mountain biking sport. What are the things specific to mountain biking that we ought to be trying to uh, help with uh, strength and mobility training? Right. Good question. Leadville is a mountain biking event. There are some very challenging descents. I have ridden them myself, and I I remember the terror of going down Paraline. Um, With that said, (laughs) we need to increase our awareness of our body. That's proprioception. So complex core movements and complex single leg strength movements, like a single leg deadlift, do help one increase their balance, coordination, and proprioception. I believe that transfers over to handling your bike better. And when you can handle your bike better, you're going to be safer and you're going to end up being more powerful 
and faster because you have more efficiency with how you're moving. The big picture for me, sort of like the 10,000 foot view, is that we need to be strong humans. We're all getting older and it is scientifically a fact that we lose muscle as we get older. Biking is a catabolic sport. We are breaking down our muscles. Um, cycling is also non-bearing. We're doing nothing on the bike that's going to help improve bone density or prevent muscle loss. So we need to be working in the gym. And when I say the gym, it can be your basement. But we need to be doing strength training so that we are a strong human being and can do what we love. And what we love is to ride our bikes. Thanks again to Coach Kathy Waite. To get involved with Kathy and Cody, check out weightendurance.com. That's W-A-I-T-E, endurance.com. And as a bonus, Weight Endurance is offering a really great discount to listeners of this show. To get $100 off the Weight Endurance $600 Leadville training package, just email Cody at teamweight.com. And it's worth mentioning that Kathy and Cody segments on this program are brought to you by The Feed. You know, if you start weightlifting, you're going to want to uptake or get more protein in your system, especially post-gym sessions. And the feed has protein mixes that are great recovery tools. Plus, the feed has a great program for our listeners. How would you like 80 bucks to spend on any nutrition brand or product that fuels your training and racing? Right now, you can get $80 in annual credit at The Feed. The Feed is the largest online marketplace for athletes to shop sports nutrition, high-performance supplements, and recovery gear you need to make your workout even better. So go ahead and claim your $80 annual credit at thefeed.com slash Leadville. Register your email, verify your phone number, and then spend your first feed credit of 20 bucks right away. Let's wrap Season 5, Episode 4 of the Leadville Podcast. Again, thanks to Kathy Waite for the sets and reps. Hadi and I are, of course, on social media. I'm on Twitter, at Fat Cyclist. Hadi's on Instagram, at Michael Hutton. Of course, we're both on Facebook. We are at the Leadville 100 Mountain Bike Participants page, probably more often than is healthy. <laughs> if you have a question, join our Slack channel. You can sign up and have a conversation with either or both of us easily by going to leadville.fm slash Slack. If you like the show, go to wherever you listen and give us a five-star rating and write a review. And to see all the ways you can find this show, open a browser, head to leadville.fm. Please tell your racing friends too. This is an independent podcast. We need our fans to help spread the word. And I get the last words here, Fatty. Good luck in your writing, racing and recovery. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you at the starting line.